Hello everybody, this is my one, it is a beautiful day. I see Scott back from Donate and Blood. Yay. In my day, I get coffee. Hey, Jamie. Oh, sorry. That's my real name. Hi, friends. It's me, Bailey Sarian. Normally, um, I sit down with you on Mondays for murder. So, guys, I can't drink coffee right now because I just donate some blood. I had to, to wait for a couple of hours, you know. Hey, seriously? Yes. Now, wait, dude, guys. I'm not mom, you know. You know. Yeah. Stream makeup over on my YouTube channel. Now I'm going to be sitting down with you every Wednesday to talk about murder, mystery, and history. This is Dark History. Remember history from grade school? Yeah, honestly, I don't remember much either. I just feel like they never taught us the truth. Or maybe like they just didn't want us to know the truth. But one day you wake up and you're like, you know what? Christopher Columbus was actually just a terrible person. So let's talk about the real history that went on around here and get down to the nitty gritty and gruesome details. Oh, we've got massacres, bloodbaths, and devastating destruction. I mean, nothing is off the table here. Because you know what they say, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Dark History premieres June 2nd, and you can find all of the episodes on Wednesday for free, wherever you listen to podcasts, and Thursday on my YouTube channel. Dark History is an audio boom original. This is a bit feel. In 1997, James Cameron's Titanic movie set sail in the box office, and the world of cinema has never been the same since, with this epic love story and exploration into the tragic voyage of the RMS Titanic turning Leonardo DiCaprio and Kate Winslet into huge megastars. Set in modern day, Titanic is about a team of treasure hunters exploring the Titanic wreckage to find a long lost diamond necklace called the Heart of the Ocean, where an elderly lady called Rose claims to have worn the necklace the night the ship sank. Rose is brought to the explorer's ship, where she tells of her time on Titanic, where she was an upper class passenger who met a third class passenger, <coughs> Jack, where they began a love affair, a love affair that was forbidden by the class system of society expectations, but above all, a love affair that encountered the tragedy of the Titanic after the ship hit an iceberg, in an adventure of survival and chaos. In this movie, that is one third period piece drama about the Titanic and early 1900s society, one third romantic drama, and one third disaster movie. So today we are going to explore James Cameron's Titanic masterpiece by looking into 10 things that you didn't know about this movie as we try to answer many great questions surrounding this 1997 movie. Like, which actors were originally considered to play Jack and Rose? Is James Cameron really that difficult to work with? What happens when you spike soup with mind-altering drugs? And is the Jack Dawson character secretly a time traveller? Yes, all that and more. Let's check it out. Number 10, it grew from James Cameron's love of the Titanic. Although in the 80s and early 90s it seemed that director James Cameron had a love for action-packed science fiction movie spectacles, while with him directing the two Terminator movies, Aliens, The Abyss, and True Lies, his true passion was not a futuristic robots or aliens from other worlds, but in fact long lost shipwrecks of old. And of course the granddaddy of shipwrecks was the Titanic. The luxury ship that hit an iceberg and sank on its maiden voyage. The seeds were kind of put in motion for the Titanic movie in 1992, when an IMAX movie was released called Titanica, which thanks to an expedition featured footage from the Titanic wreckage, where Cameron seeked funding so he could have his own expedition and explore the underwater wreckage. And it was there that Cameron got to work on a Titanic script. Number 9, the studio was reluctant because it wasn't like Terminator. Cameron 
Cameron led several expeditions to the Titanic in 1995, where he and his crew would film actual footage of the Titanic. He wrote a script which, to him, was something of a morality tale, a tragic love story of the ages that explores the society outlook on upper class versus lower class, especially of the early 1900s, along with the female lead being alive now in modern times as a link between now and the past. <coughs> Cameron took his script to 20th Century Fox and pitched the movie which he described as being Romeo and Juliet on the Titanic. But 20th Century Fox weren't sure if a three-hour love story would sell, asking Cameron if there were any action sequences or car chases. In other words, more like the Terminator. But given that Cameron had previously directed Terminator 2 Judgment Day, which was the biggest movie of that time, they wanted to keep Cameron happy, so they can work on future projects with him, so they greenlit Titanic. Okay, I'm getting my while. Some of those projects that 20th Century Fox were hoping to work with Cameron on was a supposed Spider-Man movie and a Planet of the Apes movie. But what they actually got was Avatar 13 years later. Number 8. Rebuilding the Titanic Cameron wanted to be as authentic as possible and wanted the Titanic ship in his movie to be as close to the real one. So much so he managed to get access to blueprints of the original Titanic and basically rebuild it to its exact scale and detail. With the help of 20th Century Fox, 40 acres of waterfront was purchased in Rosarito in Mexico, where a 17 gallon water tank was constructed in order to film the ship's exterior and scenes of characters in the Atlantic Ocean. In order to bring the Titanic back to life, miniature models were also used, as well as CGI. The interiors were designed by James Bond set designer Peter Lamont, of which he and his team studied designs and fashions of the 1910s. Titanic's budget consisted of a staggering $200 million, making it the most expensive movie of its time. So there was a lot gambling on Titanic being a hit. I mean, damn. Cameron was so hell-bent on his Titanic ship looking exactly like the real one, he even hired Titanic historians to inspect the ship to make sure it's down to its head. It all sounds crazy and slightly OCD, but it was all worth it, as his care and attention to detail really pays off. Number 7. Passenger Possibilities So the big question is, who could play the two main love leads of Jack and Rose? The casting was one of the most important aspects, as the romance was the main strength of the movie, and had to be convincing. Tom Cruise was interested in playing Jack, but his fee would have been too high. Cameron asked Jared Leto to audition, and he declined. Jeremy Sisto did several screen tests, but ultimately wasn't cast. Leonardo DiCaprio was recommended to Cameron, of which DiCaprio originally wasn't really all that interested in the part. And while doing test readings, he even resulted to goofing around the place. But Cameron still saw a spark in DiCaprio despite his boyish, cheeky misbehaving, and cast him in the role. Despite DiCaprio's flippant attitude to the part, Kate Winslet really wanted the role of Rose. Several big-name actresses of that time were considered, like Reese Witherspoon, Gwyneth Paltrow, and Winona Ryder. Cameron wasn't originally sold on Winslet, but was immediately won over by the British actress after seeing her screen test and amazing chemistry with Leonardo DiCaprio. A young Lindsay Lohan was going to play that little girl who Jack describes as being his best girl, but it was decided that her red hair was too similar to Rose's and her mother's. As for the movie's villain, the sinister antagonist Carl, well, supposedly Rob Lowe pursued the part but didn't get it, along with Matthew McConaughey. Although some sources suggest that he also sought after the Jack role too, so who knows. Billy Zane got the role as Cameron was impressed with his performance in The Phantom one year earlier. Kathy Bates took time out from torturing oh, yeah? James Caan to play the rich socialite, the unsinkable Molly Brown. She was one of few to play a character in the movie who was actually based on a real person who was on board the ship. David Warner was cast as Carl's brutish right-hand man, Lovejoy. He's kind of like the odd job of Titanic. And Bill Paxton was cast as Brock, a modern-day marine explorer who is searching for the heart of the ocean diamond. Yes. And, well, let's face it, having Bill Paxton on board will make any movie that bit better. After the release of Titanic, there was something of an urban legend 
that an actual Jack Dawson was in fact on board the real Titanic. Well, that turned out to be sort of true, as there was a Joseph Dawson who worked in the bowels of the Titanic shuttling pole, of which he sadly lost his life due to the Titanic disaster. Number six, erratic perfection. As mentioned, Cameron was a perfectionist with his craft when it came to making Titanic. He was so hell-bent on everything being authentic, he even hired an etiquette coach to teach the cast of the upper-class passengers how to present themselves in a 1910s manner. Cameron himself even drew the famous sketch of Rose wearing the heart of the ocean. However, his attention to detail also supposedly caused some tensions on set. There are stories of Cameron's hot-headed style of filmmaking as far back as the first Terminator but his supposed hard-hitting manner was even more exposed during the making of Titanic, with him being dubbed the scariest man in Hollywood, with stories of him yelling at the cast members with a megaphone and swooping down right in their faces while sitting on a crane. Kate Winslet said that she was, quote, frightened of him and could never work with him again unless she was paid a ton of money. And on one occasion, she even chipped her elbow bone. A 90-hour per week work schedule took its toll on DiCaprio, with the young actor suffering exhaustion several times during filming. Several of the cast and crew even developed colds and flus as well as kidney infections from spending long periods of time in the water tank that was used for filming, along with stories of stuntmen breaking bones. Co-star Bill Paxton said that Cameron was not one for winning hearts while making movies, claiming that he had an alter ego called Midge, which is Jim Backwards. However, one of the strangest stories associated with the disconnect between Cameron and his cast and crew is a supposed incident while filming in Canada where an angry crew member spiked Cameron's suit with the drug Angel Dust, which led to 50 people who ate the suit to be rushed to hospital. Oh, yikes. So whether or not the Titanic movie came from the heart and pure imagination of Jim or the tyrant filmmaking of Mitch or both, one thing is for sure, these efforts gave us a classic memorable movie. Number five, the broken wooden door controversy. So in the movie's climax, we see Jack and Rose in the freezing waters of the Atlantic Ocean after the Titanic sinks, where Jack helps Rose seek refuge on a floating wooden door to keep her out of the lethal water temperatures, which of course leads to Jack's death. Over the years, this has caused great discussion and debate among fans who believe there was more than enough room for Jack to also climb on board the wooden door and thus his death could have been avoided. I've even seen some fans get downright angry and accuse Rose of being a terrible character for not sharing the floating piece of wood with Jack. Even scientists have chimed in on this cinematic controversy and concluded that although there would have been room for Jack on the chunk of wood, had he climbed on board, then it would have sank. But this didn't stop the fury no, of Aaron. outraged fans who claimed that Jack and Rose could have taken turns of laying on the wooden door. In fact, this dispute has gotten so out of hand, James Cameron himself had to shade light on the outrage, where he concluded that Jack simply gave up having a spot on the piece of wood so Rose could survive. And that's all there is to it. It was just a matter what? of Jack protecting Rose at all costs. But yeah, you know the debate of has to get in on the case. The broken off piece of wood isn't the only fan discussion involved with Titanic Eva. There are some fan theories that Jack himself caused the Titanic to sink as he saved Rose from leaping off the ship, and thus had Rose jumped and that no doubt would have affected Titanic's trajectory, and thus probably wouldn't have even hit the iceberg. <coughs> and even more insane are claims that Jack is also a time traveller, hence his stylized 90s haircut. Jack also mentions going fishing at Lake Wysota, which was a man-made lake built in 1917, five years after the sinking of Titanic. Jack also mentions riding on the Santa Monica Pier Ferris wheel, but that was built until 1916, four years after the Titanic sinking. So, who knows, maybe Skynet sent Jack to save Rose from jumping off the Titanic as she was John Connor's great-great-great-great-grandmother and in doing so, caused the Titanic to sink. <coughs> Number four, Titanic after it's still Titanic. Having a Titanic understandably had a long legacy after its release. The movie in fact holds a record with it still being shown in theatres when it was released on VHS. 
Now keep in mind that Titanic came out in December 1997 and its VHS was released in September 1998. That's almost a year of being in theatres. Cameron's love for the Titanic didn't end with the movie, as in 2003 he made a documentary movie called Ghosts of the Abyss, which is about him and a team exploring the Titanic's remains at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean, where viewers can get really up close and personal with the world's most famous shipwreck, and I highly recommend it. The documentary also features Bill Paxton, and a scene where the crew learn of the 9-11 attacks, a scene which literally binds two tragic disasters together. Then in 2012, a 3D conversion of Titanic was released, of which the conversion cost $18 million, and even replaced some of the movie's night sky scene with real night sky footage, as opposed to CGI sky. There are even talks of building a replica of the Titanic and calling it Titanic 2, and setting it out on the exact same voyage as the original. The irony is this was the plot of a 2010 movie also called Titanic 2. Spoilers, they hit an iceberg. Number 3, Titanic originally wasn't going to have a song attached to it. Oh yes, we all know that track, Celine Dion's My Heart Will Go On, and on and on and on it did, as there was no escaping this song in 1997. It was everywhere. This was without a doubt a love ballad that went a long way, which is quite impressive during a time of bubblegum pop with the likes of Spice Girls, Hanson and Backstreet Boys. Whenever Dion's musical vocals start calling out you're here, people's minds automatically instantly think of Titanic and seeing Jack and Rose on the front of the ship. However, Cameron originally had no intention of releasing a song to go with Titanic. He wanted the music of the movie to have no words. Titanic was scored by composing legend James Horner, where he gives Titanic a timely tune, which often sounds both Celtic and tragic, but always powerful, and he saw potential in recording a song using cues that he had written for the movie, where he met with Celine Dion and lyric writer Will Jennings in secret, and recorded a demo of My Heart Will Go On, and when Cameron heard the track, he was instantly sold, and My Heart Will Go On became part of Titanic's ever-growing success. And go on, it has. In fact, it's never really stopped. Ow, oh, my leg. <laughs> Number two, alternative ending. As with most movies, there are tons of deleted scenes that didn't make it into Titanic and ended up on the cutting room floor. The movie is three hours long. Naturally, there was going to be scenes that didn't make the cut. Some of the scenes that fascinate me were more scenes involving the Brock character and his obsession with finding the heart of the ocean, along with a scene where Rose enters the third class part of the ship, where all the surrounding passengers yeah, go quiet and just...